uh, you know, thinking about Easter and, and all of the salvations and all of that, it's just uh, it's amazing uh, to think about all the people that came to Christ around the world last weekend. But this is my question. Seven days later, where are those people? And what are those people doing? You know, many of those people are, are returning back. Uh, something happened inside of them. But I also realize that many of those people today, seven days later, are questioning and they're doubting. And they're thinking, you know, did God really enter into me? Was I really transformed? Was that just an emotional experience? Is God really real? And, and I can tell you that a huge amount of these people are dealing with questions and doubts. It was about five years ago when we were in our other location, and I was invited to speak at our young adult service on that Thursday night. And so I went in and spoke, and they asked that, that I would stay. And, and so I, I stayed after the service and sat in a chair just like this in front of several hundred students, and they wanted to ask questions, and I would answer the questions the best that I could. There was one young lady who stood up, and she said, Pastor, she said, something is bothering me about my relationship with God. And, and she said, you know, I, I, I accepted Christ a year ago, been following him, but I found that when I, when I have a tragedy or something goes wrong in my life, things are not going well, that, that I always start questioning God. And I question the Bible. And I don't understand. And I get frustrated. And, and, I, and I wish I had the answers. I just have a problem with doubting. And then she said to me, you know, I look at you as our pastor, and I see how solid and how grounded and how unshakable your faith is. What is your secret of being able to have that kind of unshakable faith? And I can tell you when she answered or asked me that question, it kind of took me back for a moment. And I responded to her saying, that I work on having a solid, unshakable faith. But I want to tell you, you and me are a whole lot alike because I question, I doubt, and I struggle with doubt from time to time. You know, this is the big, the big area of, of our spiritual lives that the church doesn't talk a lot about because it makes us feel uncomfortable that we would question the Bible, that we would question God in our lives. And yet what you find is in the Bible is that, that the bout with doubt is all through the Bible. What you find is that Thomas doubted the resurrection. Gideon doubted the call of God upon his life. Moses doubted standing at the burning bush. Abraham and Sarah they doubted God's promise. In fact, they laughed at the promise of God. Martha and Mary, they doubted that Jesus could raise their brother from the dead. And so you see that doubt is basically a problem encountered by all believers, by me and by you. You know, when we talk about doubt from the Word of God, immediately our minds go to doubting Thomas. You know, Thomas uh, was a I mean, a rock-solid follower of God. When you read the whole story of Thomas, you find that, that I mean, he was sound. I mean, he was, he was a great, godly man who eventually gave his life for Christ. I mean, died in the streets preaching Christ. And yet we've labeled him as Doubting Thomas. Do you realize that, that every hero of faith in the Bible, that we could take that same label and put it on every single one of them because every great man of God has struggled with doubts? Now, Thomas, if you remember, he was uh, with Jesus after he rose from the grave. Jesus came and appeared to the disciples. Thomas, for whatever reason, wasn't in the room with the disciples when he appeared. Whenever they saw Thomas again, they said, Thomas, you're not going to believe it. But, but Jesus appeared to us, and he didn't believe it. He said, I, I kind of doubt that. And what Thomas was saying was, I'm not believing just because you tell me so. But I will not believe until I, I touch the nail prints in his hand and touch the wound in his side. Then I will believe. You know, we criticize Thomas 
But I try to put myself into that, into that story. And what would I have done? I would have done the very same thing as Thomas. Because by nature, what we want to do is we want to believe, but we want to see. We want to know that I have seen it, and I know that it is fact. I'm not going to believe it until I see it. And that's the way Thomas was. It was one week later that Thomas now is sitting in that same room with those disciples, and Jesus appears again. This time when Jesus appears, he says nothing to no other disciple at that moment, but he goes straight for doubting Thomas. Holds out his hands and says, Thomas, here I am. Come and put your finger in the nail print of my hand and touch my side where the wound was. And then Thomas falls to his knees and says, my Lord, my God. And at that moment, he believed. You know, it's it's a strange thing because Jesus appeared after the resurrection for 40 days after that to different men and women. Many, many people saw Jesus. He, he talked with them, visited with them. The disciples even ate with him over that 40-day period of time. And the last day that man saw Jesus in that physical form was when he stood on a hillside getting ready to ascend into heaven. It was on that hillside where it said that nearly 500 people had gathered and it was at that moment that Jesus gives the great commission. He's giving great instruction to his followers because he's getting ready to ascend into heaven and it's at that moment that he's standing there, the risen Savior, risen from the grave. And in Matthew 28 and verse 17, sitting on that hillside, when they saw him and they worshipped him, but some doubted. That is incredible to me. That they are seeing and they are hearing the raised Son of God. And yet, some doubted doubted. You know, faith requires doubt in order for it to be faith. In other words, faith and doubt go hand in hand. Faith and doubt are bed partners because you have to have doubt to operate in faith because there's no need for faith if you don't have doubt. And you see, in our lives, there is a level of doubt. The reason why that we have to operate in faith is because we're having to overcome the doubt and the questioning in our own lives. But you know, doubt can be the catalyst that takes us to a deeper spiritual relation with Jesus Christ. It was on one occasion that Jesus looked at his, his disciples and said, Oh, you of little faith, how long will you doubt? I mean, they just struggled with doubt. In Matthew 21 and 21, it says, And Jesus replied, Truly I tell you that if you have faith and do not doubt, and he goes on saying you can do what I do and even greater things, and he was encouraging them not to doubt. You know, as a minister of the gospel, someone who has followed Christ, and, and I know Christ, and I, I love Christ, Jesus, and, I, and, I, and I, I follow him at the highest level that I can, I want to tell you and I want to admit that there are days that I have questions and I struggle with doubt and I don't understand and I, and I may even get frustrated at times saying, God, I don't understand why this is happening in my life. I don't understand why it's happening in their life. God, life does not seem fair at times. All kinds of questions. And overcoming doubt is a constant fight in our lives. In John chapter 6, and starting with verse 28, and they, talking about the disciples, asked Jesus, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Now, the phrase here, the work of God is, is this. And I looked up the word work in the Greek, and it means to toil and to labor. And what Jesus was saying, he is saying, it is hard work to believe. 
It is hard work to keep on believing day in and day out. It's hard work to believe when life is caving in on you. It is hard work. And I believe that's the reason why the Word of God also tells us that we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But as Christians, how do we deal with the guilt that we feel when we begin to doubt and we begin to question? And God, I know what the Word of God says, but I'm not so sure you're hearing me. I'm not so sure you care about me. You may care about somebody else, but God, where are you in my life? And we doubt what the Word of God says. I think one of the best things that we need to do is go to the Word of God and look at someone who doubted, who fought the, ba the battle of, of doubting, and it's John the Baptist. Now, in Matthew chapter 3, starting with verse 1, we find this amazing story of John. In verse 1, it says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Dropping down to verse 6, Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Dropping down to verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What you find in this passage is that John the Baptist was, was, a, was a dynamic, bold, courageous preacher of God's Word. And he preached out in the wilderness, and I mean thousands of people were now flocking from Jerusalem and from all the surrounding areas and, and from all over the region. Huge crowds of people were coming out to hear him as he proclaimed the word of God with boldness. Now, Herod, who was the ruler over Galilee at that time, Herod had traveled to to Rome to visit his brother. His brother had a beautiful wife. And while Herod was visiting his brother, he seduced his brother's wife. Herod then goes back home to divorce his wife and to steal away his brother's wife. Well, the word of this started spreading through the community. John the Baptist gets hold of this, and he is going to confront Herod the king. And so he doesn't write him an email, and he doesn't send a text, doesn't write a letter, but he's going face-to-face, eye-to-eye with Herod. Herod is now in a public forum, in a setting publicly, and now John the Baptist steps out of the crowd of people, faces Herod, points his finger at him, calls him out on his sin, and he condemns the sin calls Herod to a place of repentance. Now, Herod is furious. Immediately, he has this wild man, John the Baptist, arrested and thrown into prison. Not just any prison, but they take John all the way down close to the Dead Sea, where there's an abandoned fortress that has been turned into a dungeon. And John is thrown away, locked away in a tiny little cell far away from everyone else. Good riddance. And now, John, who was used to freedom, had probably never lived a day inside, lived outside in the, in the cool air and, and, and just enjoying the wide open spaces, is now confined in this small little cell day after day after day. This week when I read that story, my mind flashed back to when Kay and I were, were in Venice and we were visiting the Doge Palace and down below was a dungeon that we were able to go into and where many men spent the rest of their lives in these tiny little cells of stone and iron bars. You were able to step inside a few of those, and, and standing there, my mind would race thinking that I'm standing in the place where men spent the rest of their lives in this miserable, tiny, little place. How can you bear that? In one of the cells, I noticed that, that there was a tiny little window up, up fairly high, and I also noticed that there were two little grooves that were worn, worn away in the stone 
up, up right at the window level. And what I realized was that the prisoner in that cell every day would jump, leap up and grab a hold of the windowsill, pull himself up and look out that tiny little window across the waters of Venice just to get one small glimpse of the outside world that he would never experience again. Just one glimpse of the, of the waters in which he would never touch, never swim in, never ride upon, and then drop back down into the misery of that tiny little cell. And that's exactly what John the Baptist was experiencing. Now John has been sitting in that dungeon, in this God-forsaken place, in this desert area of where it's stifling in that little cell, now for over a year of his life. And now questions begin to arise. And John is thinking, I've been faithful. I have done exactly what God has called me to do. I proclaim the coming of the Messiah. I was the forerunner before Jesus Christ. I am a close relative to Jesus himself. I took the Nazarite vow, which is the highest level of spiritual commitment. I've done all of these things, and this is where I end up. This is my reward. You see, we doubt, or that we have doubts. And doubt comes from our inability to deal with difficult situations. And he was in a difficult situation, did not know how to deal with that, and now doubts begin to spring up everywhere. And he's thinking, if he is the Messiah, if he really is the comforter, if he is the deliverer, if he is the God of peace, then why am I going through all of this? Where is this God that I proclaimed? If you'll remember in Matthew chapter 11, here, John is, is now being visited by some of his own disciples. Somehow, they've been able to come to this prison and visit with him. And you find here that he says, I want you to go back. I want you to find Jesus. And I have a question that I want to ask him. And John says, ask this. Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Now, that is a powerful question to ask Jesus. Are you really God? Are you really the Messiah? I mean, are you really the one that you say that you are? And now he has all of this doubt and all of these questions. But just one year before, if you remember, it was John standing at the Jordan River watching Jesus come over the hillside. And it was John who proclaimed him to the world, first of all, when he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It was just a few verses later that we, we read where John says, I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. I mean, at that time, he knew that this is God, that this is the Messiah. I know that I know that I know that this is the Son of God. How can somebody be so certain and yet harbor such doubt later on? For John... There was no place on earth more dark and more hopeless than the prison cell in which he was sitting in. And he's flooded by questions and doubts. Are you really the promised Messiah? These disciples went back and found Jesus. And they asked Jesus the question, John wants to know, are you the one? Or do we need to look for someone else? Jesus' response was he said, go back and tell John what you have seen today. Go back and tell John that you have seen the blind and they see. The lame and they now walk. Lepers are cured. Deaf now hear. The dead are raised. The gospel is preached to the poor. It's the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. And then the Bible says, and John's disciples turned around to leave. And as they turned around to leave, in Matthew eleven eleven, 11, Jesus speaks in a booming, loud voice. 
that his disciples who are now starting to walk away hear what he says. And he says, I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not been one risen anywhere greater than John the Baptist. And he wanted John's disciples to hear it. There's no one greater than John. And they went back and they told John what Jesus had said. You see, Jesus made this statement, no one is greater than John. When John was sitting in prison, when John was still doubting, when John was filled with uncertainty, when John was so unsure who Jesus was, and it was as if Jesus was saying that day that, John, you may doubt me, but I don't doubt you because I know who you are and that we have a relationship and that I don't doubt you but I honor you. And Jesus affirmed John even in his doubts on that day. You know what that makes me want to do? It makes me want to say every church needs to put a sign over the front doors that just says, doubters welcome here. Doubters welcome in this place. You know, you have doubts, come on in. You have questions, come on inside. You have uncertainties, you, ha you are a skeptic, maybe you're searching for truth. Come on inside, everybody is welcome. You know, doubts, doubts aren't sinful. In fact, doubts can be helpful, but doubts can also be incredibly dangerous. And it all depends on what you do with your doubt. You know, there are three ways to move from doubt to faith that I want to give to you this morning. Three ways. Number one, act on your faith and not on your doubts. Act on your faith. Don't act on your doubts. It's exactly what you find every great hero of faith doing in the Word of God when you find that it's exactly what Noah did when he built the ark. It's what Abraham did when he offered up his son Isaac. It's what Moses did when he stood in front of the Red Sea. It's what David did when he stood in front of Goliath. And it's what Daniel did when he was thrown into the lion's den. And all of these great heroes in every one of those situations, don't you know that there was fear? Don't you know that there was some doubting at that last moment? And yet they did not focus on the doubt, but they focused on their faith. And they trusted God. It was almost as if they took this deep breath trusted in God, stepped forward, acted on their faith and not on their doubts, and it moved them into the supernatural. The second thing that we find is that we are to doubt, doubt your doubts, not your faith. Doubt your doubt, not your faith. You know, so many times we'll find ourselves in a dark situation. I mean, it is like a valley of darkness. Everything is caved in. Everything is wrong. The situation couldn't become any worse. At those moments, we are tempted to give in to our doubts and our fears and our worries. But I want you to remember two words. When you are in the valley of darkness, when everything has gone wrong in your life, then Two words, keep walking, just keep walking, keep walking, because if you just keep walking, the sun will begin to shine once again. Don't camp out in the valley. Don't camp out in the doubting. Get up and keep walking and just keep walking and God will deliver you out of the valley. The third thing is keep going back to what you know is true. Now, this is a powerful principle. Just go back to what you really know is the truth. You may not know a whole lot about other things. There may be a lot of questions that you have in life that you cannot answer. But just go back to what you know. It's what the Apostle Paul did. In Romans 8, 38, he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power... He goes on and says, for I am persuaded that nothing could separate me from my God. Nothing can do that. Because what he was doing was holding 
on to what he knew was right. Paul also said in 2 Timothy 1.12, I know in whom I believe. Do you know in whom you believe today? Even though in the midst of doubt, even in the midst of questioning, even in the midst of your frustration of life, do you know in whom you believe? You know, sometimes we think, sometimes we hope, sometimes we just know. And in times of trouble, just keep going back to what you know. As I've mentioned, I struggle from time to time with doubt. I struggle from time to time with why things happen the way they happen. But what I know, I really know. What I know, I mean I really, really know. There are some convictions in my life that over all these years that I've served God, that there are some foundational convictions, some things that cannot be shaken, some things that cannot be ripped out of me. I may question and I may doubt some things, but I jotted down this week some things that I know, that I know, that I know that is inside of me, and I don't care what happens. I don't care what circumstances take place. They cannot be rocked out of me. Let me share them with you. I jotted down this week what I know that I know that I know is that God is good and that Jesus is Lord and the Bible is true and life is short and every day is a gift and people matter more than things and, f and fame is fleeting and the world is not my home that he is God and I am not God. And I can completely trust him even when it seems like life is spinning out of control. That's what I know. That's what I know that I know that I know. Now I may again doubt a lot of things, but those things I do not question or doubt. You know, the World Poker Tour I noticed on television last night starts today. You know, there's been a couple of times that I've sat down and, and I've watched this tour of people playing poker, some of the greatest poker players in the world, sitting around a table, and it's fascinating to watch the eye contact and how they play the game with one another. But what I've also noticed is what distinguishes the winner from the losers is the moment when one of the players says, all in, I'm all in. And he takes all of the chips on the table and pushes them to the center. And he turns over his cards and he reveals them at that moment. Because what he believes is that his hand is better than anyone else's hand. And at that moment, it's all or nothing. I mean, he's putting it all on the line. And it's the only way that anyone can ever win the game is when you're willing to be all in. It was many years ago when I decided that I'm not playing the church game anymore. There was a day in my life when I made the mental decision and the spiritual decision of saying that I'm not playing it anymore, that I'm going to be all in, I'm not half in, I'm not sort of in, I'm not kind of in, I'm going to be all in with my life. And at that moment... It's like taking everything in my life and, and just pushing it to the middle of the table and saying, God, here it is. Here are everything that I have. It's all in. It's all yours. And it's the only way you'll ever truly win in life is when you come before God and just say, I am all in. You know, I recently came across a statement that really spoke to me. And it reads like this. One who has never doubted has only half believed. One who has never doubted has only half believed. Charlotte Elliott, back in 1822, traveled to London to visit some friends. When she got there, they all went out to dinner that night, and her friends invited one of their friends who was a well-known pastor, and his name was Milan. At that dinner that night, Charlotte had never met this minister, and, and he just leaned over and said to her, are you a born-again believer? Are you a Christian? 
He could tell that that question caught her off guard and it, it frustrated her and she didn't know how to deal with it, didn't know how to respond to it. And, and he quickly realized that he had embarrassed her at the table. And he apologized. He said, hey, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. He said, I was just wanting to know if you had ever invited Jesus Christ into your life, the one that can change your life, the one that can bring such benefit into your life, and that the one who gives eternal life. And Charlotte said, you know, I've never really given God much thought. I've never even really thought about how to get to heaven. She said, you know what, when it comes to God, I have so many questions and I have so many doubts. I don't even know how to begin to come to God. And Milan simply said, you know, in all of your doubts, in all of your questions, just come as you are. Just come with all of your doubts and all of your questions. Well, that was the end of the conversation. Several months later, Charlotte returns to London. They all get together again, and they all go out to dinner. This time, Charlotte is the one that brings up God in the conversation. And there, what she says is, is something pretty remarkable. And, and, and she is, let me, I just lost it. Let me give it, get it back here real quick. And I'm not going to get it back. Hey, let me see that notebook real quick. I hate that when that happens. <laughs> I want to read this. I want to read these words with you as I finish this morning. She, uh, she was sitting there at the table, and she said, I have thought about what you said. Come just as you are. She slid a piece of paper across the table, and she said, I wrote this poem. It's entitled, Just As I Am. Milan picked up the piece of paper and he started reading these words, Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. You know, it was several years later, back in 1849, that William Bradbury took that little writing and turned it into a song. And that song became the theme of every Billy Graham crusade. That at the end of his sermon, when he had everyone stand in the stadium, and he said, come, just as you are. Thousands of people would begin to flow out of those stands, coming down to the front to receive Christ, as they would sing this amazing song, just as I am. The third verse of that song is Charlotte's testimony. And it reads, just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict and many a doubt, fightings and fears within and without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Charlotte got it. She just came just as she was. She came in all of her questions and in all of her doubt, and she found the Lamb of God who changed her life. You know, what I want to say to you today is that maybe you've walked into this place frustrated, questioning, doubting. You look at your life and things are not going well, and you may even become angry at God. God, why have you deserted me? Why have you allowed me to go through all of these things? Questions. But what I do know is that God stands with his arms wide open saying, just come with all of your questions, with all of your frustration, just come. Let me show you who I am. Let me show you that I can change your circumstance. I can change your life. Just rest in him. And let him work the process, let him work the miracle, and everything will turn toward where God wants it to turn. I'd like to ask everyone to stand. As you stand today, I'd like for you to bow your heads. I want to pray with you in this ending prayer. Maybe you've walked into this room and you have not a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
You desire it and you want it. This morning, as you've listened to these words, you, you just know that this is where I am. I, I want to receive him as my Lord, my God. I want to, to just invite the supernatural into my life. I want God to guide me. I want to know who he is. The last thing that you want in life is dead religion. That's not what you need. It's not what you want. But what you want is a relationship with the God who created you, who designed you, and there's a purpose for your life and is connecting back with him. That's what you desire. With every head bowed and every eye closed, and as we pray, I, I would like to ask, how many of you, just right where you stand in this ending prayer, would raise a hand and say, Pastor, pray for me in this ending prayer because I want to receive Jesus in my life right now, today. Just raise your hand, put it up, and you can put it right back down. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, hands are going up all over the building. And this is your great moment to invite him into your life. It's with your own lips and with your own words that you just pray the prayer and you just invite him in. And, and as you do, Jesus said, I come. I will come. All I need is an invitation. And you may not know what this really means and what's before you, but let me tell you, you're inviting the God of the universe to come and reside in you, to guide you, to help you, to, to benefit your life. Most of all, to give you eternal life. So as I pray, would you pray with me? And let's ask that God would do this. Father, right now, as we pray together, I ask, Lord, that you would do an amazing work in every one of these lives. These people that raised a hand, that are praying the prayer, and they're just saying, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my past. God, I want to start all over today. And Lord, I want to invite you into my life. And I want to know that I'm secure in you. That, Lord, I just simply am opening the door of my heart, my mind, my life, and saying, Lord, would you come in? And, Lord, would you reside in me? And, Lord, I want to experience what the Bible calls being born again, being transformed, changed forever. And, God, I pray as you come in, that, Lord, that I'll follow you at the highest of my ability. That, Lord, I realize that there will be many fall, fail, failings and stumbling and, and, and just not doing things right all the time. But God, that you're patient with me. And Lord, that you'll pick me up every time I fall. And Lord, that you'll put me back on the right path. And Lord, that I'll grow from those experiences. So Lord Jesus, thank you for coming into my life today. I love you. I love you. I thank you for that. I receive you as my Lord, my Savior, and my God. And in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering this morning. Amen.